friend of mine says, why? Mike Henderson grew up in Marshall, Missouri in the 1940s and 50s, a predominantly white rural farming town of about 10,000 people. He knew that he wanted to be an artist, but he didn't see anybody around him living the life that he wanted to live. He didn't see any way that he could be who he wanted to be where he was. So he applied to every art school that he could and he was accepted to the San Francisco Art Institute. So in the mid 1960s, he moved to San Francisco, California, a world away from Marshall, Missouri. At the time, San Francisco was the center of the counterculture, the hippies, protests against the war, the Vietnam War, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mike found himself at the San Francisco Art Institute, an art school with a storied past and excellent faculty and cutting edge young students who wanted to add something to the art of their time. Mike was also socially aware and interested in the fight for civil rights and protests against police brutality and against war and all of the social activism of the time. And his paintings, while he was a student, reflected this. They were large protest paintings like this from 1966 titled Hot Nazi. It's 10 feet tall and 12 feet wide, oil on canvas. Or this painting titled Castration from 1967, almost six feet tall and 10 feet wide. He was also friends with some of the Black Panthers located in the Bay Area at that time. And he was interested in their cause and hung out with them And he was even invited to come meet their resident artist, Emery Douglas, who was making all the great posters and prints and uh, organizing material for the Black Panthers. But Mike spent a day with Emery Douglas and he realized that Emery was doing his work just fine and that Mike needed to go his own way, find his own path. So he continued with his large protest paintings like this, which is titled Nonviolence. And it was included recently in a traveling museum show called Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, which also included Emery Douglas's work. And in this exhibition, this painting from 1968 hung on the wall with some of Mike's own words about the painting. He said, this painting depicts white cops breaking into houses and brutalizing black people during the civil rights marches. When I started working on this painting, the cop had a gun in his hand, but I thought that was too humane. A big knife was more primitive and brutal. The figure in the background has a head and resembles a KKK hood. I wanted to portray KKK members as creatures, not people, to show how monstrous they were. Regarding the swastika and peace symbol affixed to the officer's sleeve, I wanted to draw a parallel between what the cops were doing at that time and what the Nazis did to the Jews and others in Europe during World War II. Policemen may think that they're the ones fighting for peace, but peace is just a word that, any be, that can be used by anybody. I was interested in that contradiction between peace officers and their behavior. And these are very large oil paintings, very thickly painted, very expressionistic, very crude, really. Here you see the swastika on the arm next to the peace symbol on the arm of the policeman. And then you see naked black bodies, vulnerable and bleeding and being terrorized. And here's this creature figure in the background feasting on somebody. 
and a hand reaching for help, reminiscent of the hands in Picasso's anti-war painting, Guernica. Mike Henderson did a lot of these paintings and got a lot of attention for them in the late 60s and early 70s. He earned a prestigious Skowhegan scholarship where he studied with Jacob Lawrence, Ben Sean, Philip Perlstein. He got his Master of Fine Arts from San Francisco Art Institute in 1970. In 73, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, followed by two National Endowment for the Arts Awards. He was included in important exhibitions that explored socially conscious art and black art of the time at the Whitney Museum in New York City in 1970 and 71. And around the same time, he was offered a teaching position at the art department at the University of California at Davis, which featured an all-star roster of artists on the West Coast at the time. UC Davis was known as the Yale of the West Coast, which was a high compliment because Yale was always thought of as the premier art department in the country with its roots stretching back to Joseph Albers and the Bauhaus. But UC Davis was a newer, younger department, and it was a magnet for independent, nonconformist young artists who wanted an alternative to the orthodoxies and isms of the time, minimalism, and all of the formalisms of the New York critics especially, was very prevalent among art schools. And UC Davis was a place where people went if they wanted something else, if they wanted to find their own individual path. And some of those artists who were there created or became labeled the Bay Area funk artists. They had an all-star roster of faculty, including Robert Arneson, Roy DeForest, Manuel Neri, Roland Peterson, Wayne Tebow, and William Wiley. And some of their famous alumni include Bruce Nauman, Nancy Rubens, Kathy Butterly, and many others. Mike Henderson started teaching there first in the experimental film department. And Mike was also a really cutting edge avant-garde filmmaker of the time, as well as a traveling and touring musician. But eventually he was teaching drawing and painting at UC Davis when I met him in the late 90s. And I went and took his drawing class. It was the first drawing class of the first semester of my time at UC Davis. And Mike Henderson was my first art teacher, my introduction to the Davis Art Department. Mike was like a big bear of a man, very uh, friendly, had a great laugh, was always laughing and talking and saying crazy things. And then he was also scary if he pointed his shotgun at you. He would later tell me that he taught the way that he was taught, which was at the San Francisco Art Institute, and he called it the shotgun in the face style. He could be very challenging and very uh, confrontational, but also very generous. And he was very encouraging and kind to me. And at the time, he was no longer painting those big protest paintings. I met Mike as an abstract painter. He was painting these large, uh, what they called the black paintings. These are seven feet tall, six feet tall, like seven feet by six feet or six feet feet by five feet. And they're very, very thick. He was painting them with like big trowels and then scratching into the paint, layers and layers and layers, almost three-dimensional and sculptural. And you had to go up close to them and see all the details that would happen. They were really uh, inspiring in person. You could see his love of paint and his kind of self-discovery that went on through the process of making these paintings. I've maintained a close relationship with Mike ever since. Um, and it's been great to get to just be his friend and fellow artist over the years. And I will go visit his studio now and then and have talks. Usually, you know, we talk all day, we get some food, we talk about art, we talk about life. And Mike is a great storyteller and raconteur. So 
One time, a couple summers ago, I was going to see Mike, and I went up to his backyard, walked down the driveway. He lives in the East Bay, uh, outside of Oakland, California now, in a town called San Leandro. And I buzzed his studio doorbell, and I walked back through the backyard to his studio, and into his studio, which is a great place. The smell of oil paint is thick in the air. And you can see his palette is just crusted with all kinds of years of paint over and over and over in the gloves that he wears. He's got junk everywhere, stuff everywhere. And I was sitting there and talking to Mike and catching up and looking at the painting that he was working on in the wall. And it occurred to me that this would be a perfect opportunity to get Mike to talk about his process of making abstract paintings because I know that a lot of my students if they don't grow up exposed to it then they don't really know how to approach an abstract painting a painting that doesn't have a picture of something in it but is just color and shape and paint and texture and lights and darks and composition and uh, that can be a difficult thing for students to understand and I've had conversations over the years trying to give students access to that world of abstract painting. So while I was sitting there talking to Mike, I said, hey Mike, you know, I explained that to, to him and I said, could you talk to me so that I can show my students uh, what you think about when you make these paintings and how they could think about the whole process of an abstract painting. And I knew that Mike would be great at talking about his process and the ideas that he has and how he approaches painting. And so what follows is this conversation in his studio one summer day. And I just said, Mike, you know, how would you talk about this painting? Can you explain what this is? I hope you enjoy it. So I would say like, Mike, how do you talk about that painting or that kind of painting? To me, it's all about uh, letting it come through you. I use, I use like metaphors to sort of trigger, you know, what I'm saying to be able to, because when you put the words together, you're talking to someone, so you want to you wanna make sense or something. So sometimes, you know, you begin to make too much sense because what we do can't, if words could do it, we wouldn't be painting it, uh -huh. you know? So there's no clear way of explaining it, but of, of just having the freedom to uh, let yourself go and, and, and in, you know, I, I consider, the way I started painting, I make a mess and I try to find order to it. Okay. Because I'm not... Trying, I don't have a, I don't have a, you know, like when I was doing still life or something, there was something to paint, you know, okay, paint still life and it's going to be that, so forth. But when you start, when you start painting abstractly, you start thinking about um, your subconscious and stuff like that, the stuff that comes out of you, not controlling what you think or letting, letting it come to you, you know, not being afraid to make mistakes. You know, or not being afraid to, uh, of what people might say, you know, is this art or isn't it art? Yeah. If, if it, if it, if it, if it is, then okay. If it isn't okay, uh, you know, I just, this is what I feel that I, that I want to do because when I was painting people and so forth, there was an idea behind that, you know, the right. critical paintings and so forth, or like the still life things where people might have been. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to see stuff like a second trash on the floor, or or you're walking down the street at night and you see um, uh, something, and you say, "Oh, what the heck is that? Is that a dog? Is that a person laying there? What is it?" You get close to it and you see that it's maybe. Uh, a, a paper bag or something. Yeah. But your mind has extrapolated all these thoughts, you yeah. know. And uh, getting getting to where you can sort of uh, feel 
you know, shapes and, and color as sort of the same thing, you know? Like they're just um, these metaphors that sort of play around in so, your mind. So you learn to trust your instincts. Yes. And yes. you learn to trust your the unknown visual just, sense of what uh-huh, you're doing, uh-huh. just how it. Uh-huh. what it does to your mm-hmm. eye and through your eyes mm-hmm. to your whole body. And what I feel, because this is, you know, when I was, you got to feel what you paint. And when I, when I, um, when I started to uh, paint abstractly, I sort of looked like I was, I, I started thinking like, okay, uh, I'm painting like uh, in between shapes. Mm-hmm. In between, or or you see, you see, uh, you turn your head real quick, and there's a blare or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, whatever those things are, and um, you, you, then if you if you trust yourself and you keep, you, you know, you find that uh, your mark making, or how you make marks, or 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 you get through. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna use all my favorite colors. You know, I'm not gonna use the ones I don't like and so forth. And you do that for a while. Then you say, okay, what's missing is what I'm leaving out. So you say go against all those colors you didn't want to work. Well, you start working with those, mm-hmm. and you keep exposing yourself to this. You know, like you're scraping away trying to search for something. You know. So, and yeah, go that's ahead. What, that's basically what I'm trying to do. I'm looking for something, you know, like I'm uncovering something. How do you know when you find it? Uh, it's a feeling, you know. It's like when you see that girl that you really like or that person that you fits, you know. You can't explain it, you mm-hmm. know. It's just, it just, you know, it's the same way, you know, when you, if you're playing music and you hit that note, you know, when you hear... You listen to Albert King and he plays that note and you go, wow, <laughs> or something. Else. Okay, so that's how you know it's done, maybe. But how do you, like, how do you start it? Like, if someone's painting yeah. a person mm-hmm. or a place mm-hmm. or whatever, they usually have some idea mm-hmm. beforehand. Uh-huh. I'm going to paint this person like this, and then they're kind of going toward that mm-hmm. or trying to start in a way that's going to get them. Then the mind says, why? Yeah. And you, then there's 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 the opportunity to do something else because if the mind doesn't say why, it doesn't question you. Then you you, you continue. Yeah. But when you when it says why, then you say oh, there's another space over here that yeah. I looked at. So you you scrub out the <laughs> this figure, you yeah. know, and you have this mess. Now and then you say. How can I how can I create art out of this, you know? And uh, just as it, just as it becomes order, then it turns back into chaos hmm. and so forth. Then you start saying, Ah, now I'm on to something here. It's 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 not revealing itself immediately what it is. And it has that mystery because that's what you're looking for, a mystery, you know. So how do you start it? How do you start a painting like that? I just, I just, first... Well, do you have something in mind? No. Uh-huh. Blank sometimes canvas. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I say, like on, on, uh, on some of these when I first started some there, and I said, okay, mm-hmm. uh, I haven't done anything with, uh, you know, on a square canvas. Mm-hmm. See, each canvas that you work on challenges you in a different way you have to approach it differently because when you take a rectangle it's different if you paint it on a circle it's different you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. you have to learn to see your so your concepts change you keep uh challenging yourself and uh that's something you have to keep in mind is is a way of trying to um make yourself a beginner each time you know mm-hmm. don't be afraid I always say I'm not making precious objects, so that's why I can scrub it out, mm-hmm. you know, and and continue going or scraping on the floor or whatever. And sometimes you scrape, oh, you, you discover something, oh, you know. Uh, I'm trying to get to part where, um, you know, you when you look at art history, you're going to expose to you know art as as you study it, you know, like uh, we did, you know. 
and you, you can tell when you're okay this is getting too close to Picasso or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you say okay I don't want that you know I mm -hmm. want to find my own spot you know I want to be who I am I don't want to walk in this I walked in his footsteps enough I learned enough now I don't want to go off to the beaten path yeah and it it also it not only that I um, changed what I was listening to you mean you know, music as you're playing as you're painting and 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 uh, radio talk radio then I started listening to People like T. S. Eliot and poetry, and that'll change the painting. That changes the way you see how different people use words, how they create an image with just words, and you say, "Jesus, that is amazing." I see the, you know, what he's talking about in the rooms. In the, room the women the come and go. Speaking of Michelangelo, you know, and you say, "Wow, that's incredible," you know. And you'd only you'd only see that you know when you uh, you also have to travel. You have to have to give up your uh, your all your preconceived ideas of what you think is right and wrong and 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 and, and who you are, or who you think you are, or who you want to be, and just cut down to you know the flesh and bones and and try to. Uh, create who you are and also using painting to trigger uh, you know film painting all of it music I'm trying to figure out who the hell I am you know Mike Henderson isn't enough because that's just what they called me actually it was William Henderson my aunt walked in the room and took a look at me as a baby and said that ain't William that's a Mike you know your birth certificate is William uh-huh but uh, you know, which you know, what? But you know, it's like when you know, probably like your daughter was born, or when my son was born. I, I had you have all these names, right? Then you look at him, and said, I looked at him and said, that's Isaac. Mm -hmm. It fits. Why did it fit? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, he's an Isaac. The same way my aunt knew this was a Mike, not a William. You know. And the same way with, like I said, again, discovering who you are, you know. So when you talk about travel, do you mean, do you mean literally, like oh, you need yes, to go around yes, the world? Yeah. Moving or are you also now. talking about as you paint? Are you trying to travel as you paint? No, what I do is I bring the travel with me when I'm painting. I think about stuff I saw. Right. You know, uh, you know, late one night coming back from playing up in the Alps, and you're seeing all these window shades and pulled down and the light shining through it or through a tree or or, or neon signs in New York or like like say that uh that scene of New York of Times Square there. You oh. know? You see all this stuff, you know? And it just sticks in your retinas. Uh-huh. You know, or the one that uh that's one of my favorites is uh, the picture up above. When you look at it from a distance, you see a look like you see a cabin back there. Oh, the landscape. Uh huh. Okay. Look like you see a cabin back there. What is it? It's just a tree and some woods. <laughs> no cabin at all. Uh, uh -huh. When I get on my when I get on my treadmill to, to try to do some exercises, I'm walking towards that. You actually use that thing <laughs> for storage. <laughs> that was my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you know, all of these things come back to me, you know, it's so funny, uh, uh, I can sit here and, uh, I, you know, I can be in, I remember being in, um, in um, um, uh, going from Switzerland to uh, Italy, going through that 20 mile tunnel. Uh huh. And what your mind sees and this experience that you're going through I've been through that tunnel. Yes, it changes you when you get in there. You know, you you know, all of a sudden, you know, the thoughts that run through your mind. You know, I never thought of, uh, you know, a gasoline truck blowing up in here and cremating everybody. You know, and you start to think, oh, you are there earthquakes in Switzerland? <laughs> yes. What would happen? <laughs> yes, yes, they are. 
and you're going through a tunnel of a mountain, you know. And, what if uh, this runs out of gas? And is this on yes, gas? Is this cold? Yeah. <laughs> and what if somebody stops? What if there's a wreck, you know? And the air, what are you breathing in here? There's just full of all these cars and stuff, man. And, you know, plus, all of my heroes as an artist, they all moved to different places. They all traveled, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, my among my favorite examples are, of course, all of the impressionists. You know, which uh, which uh, all um, came to Paris. They did what they did. Then they all went off in different directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was sort of like the way, uh, say, with King Arthur and his. Uh, Knights decided to go look for the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. They decided not to go as a group, mm -hmm. but each one entered the forest at a different spot to go off on their own and find this 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 uh, journey to have this journey. So they all would have they all got together. They would have a uh, different stories about their approach to searching this. Yeah. And, so painting a painting like this is is in sort of in search of. It is a kind of travel, right? Yeah, uh-huh. And you want it to start somewhere and then go somewhere else and then end yeah, somewhere just else. Yeah, just as it, it turns into chaos, it, you know, or just as, you, as you're going through this tunnel and you're thinking all these thoughts and all of a sudden you see the end of it, you know, and you see, oh, the, the blue skies of Italy on the other side, mm -hmm. you know? And, you, and your whole mind changes, you know? And you start thinking about... Italian food yeah. and so forth and, and and all this fear of gasoline and bad air is gone but these things put images in your head too those thoughts too they all do but not being afraid of your thoughts and letting your mind go you know what I mean yeah you know not so you don't want to you all of the things that you're saying are trying to get out of and away from the idea of a predetermined yeah. answer that the painting's going to look like this mm -hmm. and you're just going to mm -hmm. execute it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just the... You kind of want the opposite of that. I'm the sort of the oracle. The, 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 the painting comes through me. Uh-huh. And it, now, when I try to control it, you know, maybe I want to paint something. You say, oh, you know, nobody's buying abstract paintings, so I'm going to paint figurative. Or nobody's buying figurative paintings, so I'm going to paint abstractly. Or everybody's using green this year, so that's what's selling you. I'm <laughs> going to paint green. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we get caught up in that, and we lose, you know, what the sense of uh, that adventure is, which uh, I'm always looking for. You know, mm -hmm. I'm looking for some something. You know, I don't know what it is, but like I said again, you know. I knew it was Isaac when I saw him. You know what I mean? Do you think this stool influenced you? Oh, uh, I, everything does. <laughs> as everything I'm, does. As know? I'm filming it, I'm noticing that the yellow of that is kind of... Also the paper that I... Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And like I said again, I chose... Um, And that was Is that a set list? Uh huh. Where are you going to play? A place called the World Famous Turf Club in Hayward. Huh. <laughs> I've never been there. But you know, like, like I said, when I first started, when I I picked up yellow and black, those you know, small canvas and started doing those uh, landscapes. So yellow is a color I sort of gotten away from. Mm -hmm. And um, and just what you're doing there is something I do sometimes because sometimes I realize that uh, the other thing uh, you know that the painting may what I'm looking for might be in that one spot. Where? Which spot? Yeah. Well, I know it when I see it, sort of like you know. Oh, you're doing it with that, with a viewfinder. Yeah. Hey, wait, looking stay for, there. looking for, looking for that, that area. You know that that may be uh, challenging. You know, I might say, okay, 
I want that or this or whatever, which direction, how you go, you know. And then, then I say, I want that to be the whole canvas. How do I get that? And the first way I do is like I get rid of all my favorite parts. Uh huh. With then, what? White? What do you uh, use to, what, how do you get rid of it? Sometimes I scrape it, sometimes I put a different color there that I feel that clashes with everything. That, and it makes me, you know, it makes me go back to it and work it, you know? Uh huh. Because I'm not, like I say again, I, I'm always, I'm always reminding myself, I'm not making precious objects. And the whole uh, great uh, thing about being an artist is being an artist, you know. I don't, you know, I mean, yeah, it's good when you sell stuff or whatever, but, uh, you know, I didn't pick up a brush to think of how I was, I'm going to make a living being an artist, you know. <laughs> I just did it because I loved doing it, and it was something that was was natural to me, you know. You know, oh, he draws all the time. He draws all the time. You know, you're not you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be doing your math or your whatever. You know, and he draws all the time. He just draws all the time. You know, and he, he's, I stare at pictures all the time. I, you know, I, I remember, you know, they had, they always had the picture of Lincoln and Washington. I used to stare at him. And, you know, even if there were photographs or colored prints or whatever, and just look at this, you know, the face or something or whatever, and just, you know, my mind would just drift off to it, you know, or something into a different place by just looking at the paintings. I used to, you know, sitting in church the same way, you know, just looking at the, the all of these pictures or sometimes hearing all of you, I'd go to, um, Looking at nature, mm -hmm. you know, as a, which is my favorite thing. Like nature, you know, doesn't believe in repetition. You know, right? Yes, that's right. You know, everything, variety, is constant yes, variety. Yes, and like I say again, it, 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 look, learning how to see was a big thing too. You know, learning how to see, that was something I learned in school, learning how to look, learning how to see, you know, and learning that there, there is uh, no right and wrong, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of that. And giving the painting what it needs, you know. Like, uh, I'm not afraid to, um, at, you know, if the painting said, okay, uh, Mike, uh, Paint it all black, and and that's what it took. Okay, I do it. You know, it's just like haiku, opposed to a poem. You know, or uh, or a poem opposed to a story, or a novel. You know, just keep or or you take a, a dictionary with just all these words, and 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 you open it up, and there's nothing but words. You know, but when you have an idea of what this word means, it takes you to a different place. You know, just like you were telling me about the word you mentioned earlier about... Synesthesia. I won't even go there with my Missouri accent. <laughs> sound and color. Yeah, sound and color. Yeah. Sound and taste. Yeah. Sound and touch. And touch there, and color. And there are people who, who, who make up... Poets are great because they make up words that tell us what these things mean, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, and I you take that... Okay, you know... Um, It was like it was like um, when when I when I start seeing you know growing up seeing the, the second word first or the third word or letters I'd miss or something mm -hmm. and people say oh you're dumb you know mm -hmm. or you're not paying attention straighten mm -hmm. up here then then uh, went to this doctor and he says oh he's dyslexic mm -hmm. so all of a sudden. There was a way to deal with dyslexia. You know what I mean? So you almost use that 
as part of your process in you some kind to, of way. Because that's who you are. I didn't want to hide from it. Right, but even in painting, I'm saying, like somehow that informs how you think about well, what, what not they, going straight ahead at something. What they told me was that people who are dyslexic have uh, sort of, I guess, different ways of seeing things. Right. You know, that other people don't have. So accepting, so when I, when I realized that, that it, was, it was sort of like, I guess like, you know, in a, a, a primitive way of saying, it's like that, that person who's, uh, whose gender doesn't fit them, mm -hmm. and they're hiding from them, all of a sudden, boom, they come out, of a, mm -hmm. step out or something. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You're like, all of a sudden, I realized uh, when I was no longer beating up myself and feeling guilty because of uh, all this stuff, uh, um, there was a release of energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, I wasn't, I was no longer afraid. You know, mm -hmm. uh, having this secret here, you know, or something. Because to be an artist, you know, uh, it just constantly challenges you, and it was pulling at this spot, you know. And I went through this one period where uh, I started using um, words in the paintings. You know, maybe that was... Like you I, would write on them? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was my breakthrough, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. And, you know, eventually that went for a while, you know. Like I say again, uh, it's, 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 to me, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a gift to find out who I am, not who I've been told I am or who I should be. Uh, you know, because uh, we don't know who we are, you know. Uh, not listening, well, I, because I was named this, or my social security is this, or I live here, or this, or that. You know, that's what defines me. That You know, my car defines me because it's, uh, <laughs> my suit defines me. Yeah. You know, my, the labels define me. Yeah. But who are you, you know, when you, as an artist, uh, to get to these places, because we're the ones who, um, um, you know, uh, uh, create the, uh, the um, I don't know what word to use, the, 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 uh, the, the opportunity for others to, to, to challenge themselves, uh -huh. you know, I mean, when you look at, uh, you go to, you go to the, you go to Europe and you see these, you know the uh, all these paintings done by uh, you know whoever you want to pick uh, Caravaggio or Michelangelo or Da Vinci or whoever you feel is, and you see this stuff, and you say, okay, I don't want to duplicate them. I want to. Who who was the per who were the people who got taught them? Mm -hmm. You know. Who's the people, who was the person going to taught um, Michelangelo to carve David at 16? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was something he trusted. As he said one time, he says, all I do is chip away the unwanted pieces. Yeah, the figure's already in there. Yeah. And when I heard stuff like that, wow, that makes a lot of sense to me. You mm -hmm. know, when I heard that, you know, what was I like? Oh, God, uh, 18 or 19th when I heard that but that, you know no, no, there was no one where I grew up to talk about that stuff with yeah so so which I don't think really matters either because uh, you can have that here too in California absolutely or any place you sure. know but these, these things when I heard that it just man I was I was riding on a high like wow there's another spot out there there's another way of thinking about stuff, you know, and uh, it just, it just, it just resonates with you in a different way. You get energy from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, you know, start hearing, you know, other things that people would say, I remember in the 60s, you know, that was this whole thing, what's your bag, you know, who are you, this whole search for mm -hmm. self-identity. And when I walked into that out here, man, it was like, wow, man, I'm in the right place. And right place, right time. This, this is where everybody asks these questions, right. you know. 
they asked them in other places too, but uh, you know, when you grew up in the South or Midwest, that's, you know, you asked, or you, you know, what kind of car you got, or, you know, what's your football team doing, mm-hmm. or what? Yeah. It's those types of things, you know. And you begin to say, well, I don't fit into that, you know. And you try to fit in, you know, you do it for a minute or two, you play sports, and you say, ah, this isn't really what I want to do with my life, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. This, you know, and so forth, or, and, you know, and you, you go where those questions can be asked and you you know i remember first coming to california and i uh went to this being and there was uh ginsburg reading poetry yeah and he said Dude, what the hell is he talking in a strange language or something <laughs> you know and uh you know and, and, and you get around people uh students who i remember uh going to school there was this guy from india and he started talking about you know Indian philosophy and stuff, you know, what? <laughs> you know, they don't think about football or baseball or what <laughs> car they're driving or is that guy, is that an eight cylinder or what? And uh, there was this whole, and like, wow, man, you know, was karma and all of these things. So I exposed myself to, you know, everything that, that, that life offers, you know, the ups and downs. You know, I try not to uh, shield myself from uh, anything, you know. And that was one of the great things, like I say, about coming out here was, uh, uh, that's what I meant by travel, you know. Right. You got to find your place, you know, and and you're always in search of that, you know, because then you move on, you move on, you know. When I was going to school, yeah, I loved being around other artists and so forth. Then when I got to the point where when he graduated and, you know, started teaching at Davis and start speaking to some of those people up there who were showing and 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 working and so forth and uh and and challenging them themselves, you know, uh I uh, this is this is this is this is the words I wanna hear. This is the talk I wanna Yeah. And and uh, I want to be around people who talk about these things this way, you know. I don't, you know, I don't give a damn about <laughs> baseball, football, <laughs> fishing. Of course, I did all those things, you know. And they're slowly coming back to me, you know. Like, you know, I watch the World Series, or maybe, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'll probably watch um, uh, more football than I do any other sport. Mm-hmm. So, of course, that was going to be, I wanted that to be my way out. I thought I was going to be the next Jim Brown, you know. You know, the anger I had from being so frustrated with all this stuff mm-hmm. that I couldn't talk about or couldn't explain that was happening to me or what my body was doing, I wanted to be like him, like running over fucking people, mm-hmm. you know, just like, bam, like a battering around, mm-hmm. you know. I wanted to hurt somebody, you mm-hmm. know. Because uh, I guess maybe I was uh, I was hurting too or whatever you know and you just and it all like I say again you get to this place where after you study expose yourself enough to your dislikes and others dislikes and you want to find out really who you are you know but but it's even people who don't become artists but expose themselves to the process. They become better parents, I think. They become better uh, 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 human beings because you, because you, this whole thing of uh, art is is our culture, you know. Our culture lies within the museums and in the writing, the dancing, the music, and so forth, you know. In every culture, you know. You know, I think the biggest thing I discovered that made the world seem so small to me. When I went to Europe the first time, and I realized that everybody did this for appreciation, ah. and everybody um, laughed, they sounded the same when they laughed, hmm. and they sounded the same when they clapped their hands, but sounded differently when they talked, you know. But there was this, there was this, <laughs> these, yeah. these things, you know. Yeah, and it was universal. Yeah, yeah. I started seeing how. 
what we all had in common, you know, um, uh, you know, and hearing the hearing the phrase, well turned phrase. I can't remember who I heard it from, but it said that uh, uh, both both heads couldn't exist without tails. Hmm. Tails can't exist without heads because they're both each side of the same coin. Mm-hmm. And 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 you know, wow! When I heard that, I might have been in a humanities class or something. And uh, you know, you just you think about that. And you just you know, and it just changes the way that you. Uh, it's so subliminal, you know. The words are, you know, hmm. you know. Just like the words that, you know, people say, well, you're dumb and you don't know, you know, and you, you constantly hear this and you begin to, uh, you're going to take the shape of it or something, you know what I mean? Hmm. Because, uh, you know, you don't even know that you're doing it to yourself, you know? I mean, that, that's why I realized that when I realized that, oh, that's what women are talking about when they talk about being in an abusive relationship and they can't leave, hmm. you know? And you start seeing these things yourself, you know, and you say, Jesus, that, how horrible that is, you know. And you, again, you know, the more I learn about, the more I open myself up to what the possibilities of there's something after this or something after the next painting or the next painting or all the other blank canvases over, what do they have to offer, you know? And, um, and I realized there's, there's, there's more to explore. There's more to learn. You know. It's perfect, Mike. You know, it's, it's just, it's just. That's why I love it. You know. You got it. There we go. I love Hold on. Being in this, this cylinder here. You know. <laughs>